Hello, Asalaamu Alaikum. This is Bilal from Message Mastery. I am the host of the call. Alright, Ali. Asalaamu Alaikum. I want to welcome to the call. Uh, just so everybody knows, uh, this, is, this is a conference call with guest Baba Ali from Omo Films. This is basically a case study uh, about a young brother. He is somebody who's uh, taken some action, created Omo Films, made some videos, and in the end got some amazing results uh, as a result of his work. Now, uh, in this, I'm going to be basically asking Ali a couple questions uh, as to what inspired him, what he did, how he did it, and things like that, and what he's doing now. So, so that way, everybody gets a feeling for what it really, I mean, it's not that you, you don't have to have magical power, so you don't have to be super expert or anything like that, to be able to make videos, do dawah, and, uh, and get some income uh, at the same time. Ali, go ahead and start introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself for anyone who not too familiar with you. Assalamu alaikum, uh, my name is Ali, otherwise known as Baba Ali on the internet. On June 13, 2006, I started a video blog series called The Reminder. Um, alhamdulillah, about 30 videos later, um, videos have reached nearly 4 million video views. And I'm a brother that has, that doesn't come from a film background or has gone to film school. Uh, and I, my intention is actually not to even be in front of the camera. It just somehow ended up that way. Um, Alhamdulillah, the videos have been successful because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, part we do is we make go out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rest is in His hands. I mean, and then we put in effort, inshallah. So, um, Brother Bilal wants to start a project and uh, wants to help a lot of people learn how to do filmmaking and learn how to do like what I do. And I kind of learned the hard way of like, there's not really anyone to ask. There wasn't a class like this. So I had to go on my own and, and figure things out. And although you can do that, it takes a long time. And this is a much easier process when someone shows you how to do it. So. One thing that, uh, uh, that I want to know and I want you to tell the people is what inspired you? What started it? Well, the thing was, was that uh, I, I noticed how much of an impact movies and films make. A lot of people don't get their, their opinions based on um, what they read in the newspaper or watch on, on CNN or BBC is because most people our age are not watching CNN and BBC. A lot of the youth are watching John Stewart to get their public opinion or Bill Maher to get their, sorry, their political opinion. Our, our issue is there's no one really talking about it. I mean, I know so there's a lot of Dawah organizations teach Muslims like the basics or teach non-Muslims about what Islam is and invite them to Islam, but what happens after they accept Islam? What happens when they get into Islam? Who's talking about those issues? I go to Friday Khutbah and it's like a rerun of last Friday Khutbah and a rerun from last Friday Khutbah before that. I, mean, in, in, I live in Los Angeles here and many people know the writers were on strike and we watch reruns on television all the time. Well, whoever, went, whoever was running the Friday Khutbah, um, I don't know when he went on strike because he's never come back and all we had is reruns since. I've been Muslim for about 13 years now, and I don't know how many topics I've heard about Vudu or how to pray Salah. Not that those important issues aren't important, but there are so many other vital issues that no one's talking about. No one's talking about the girlfriend-boyfriend issue. No one's talking about the culture versus Islam issue. So I decided that I have to go talk about it, and I stand in front of the camera and, and talk about it. Once you figured out what the problem issue was and, and you felt that you had to do something, what did you do? How did, how did you do it? I remember you talked about how you went to um, Bridges TV, you had an interview, you saw their yeah. setup, and you came back. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, was, I, made, I invented a board game called Mecca to Medina, and alhamdulillah we sold out the game. Uh, but when I invented it, I went to Isna to promote it. So I set up a booth, and a lot of people were at the booth. It was so busy, it caught a lot of people's attention, including the attention of the CEO of Bridges TV, which is a cable network here in... Uh, in, it's actually it's in New York. So he invited me down. I want you. To, I want you to do a 30-minute TV show just on your board game. So I went down and uh, did a 30-minute show. And while I was there, I realized that this wasn't as complicated as I thought. I mean, of course, the filming and hardware and software in the warehouse. They had a whole cable network running. I have a warehouse, and they told me they still had an apartment. So I told myself, if these people can do it, I can do it. I mean, I went to school, I went to college, it can't be that complicated. So I came back, started playing around with different software, and camera equipment, started asking questions here and there, and trying to fix different people's brains. And alhamdulillah, eventually I figured out to buy some equipment, 
and that's how almost all started. Of course, I didn't do it all by myself. I had to call some brothers up to see if they can help me out as well. The films and the videos that you've seen so far, and that's the Asba Bali and Minim series. That's basically one person writing, editing, filming, and producing. The other can hire a team to do something, what I'm doing. So, if I can do it, someone else can do it. Now that you got the inspiration, you talked to a couple brothers, what was the process of finding out what equipment? Did you find any struggles in that, any challenges? Yeah, it, it was, because there's different opinions on the internet. Well, you, you can't just type in good camera on Google and you expect the number one camera to pop up. There's cameras that cost $14,000 and that people do podcasting from, and there's cameras you can do for two or 300 bucks. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth the $14,000? Or can I get away with two, three hundred dollars? Because by the time I compress everything, it pretty much looks very similar. So these were like it took me a while to try to figure out what type of camera is going to be best fit for what I'm trying to do. And if I had to go back, I probably, I probably do it a little bit differently. Now that I've learned, so that's why it's important to try to ask somebody that's already gone through the process, so you don't have to. Now, okay, now that you got the equipment, what were some of the inspirations for the actual ideas itself? Okay, you talked about culture versus Islam, which is a major uh, major theme of your videos. But the content that you talk about and the way and, and what you deliver it, how did that come about for you? Well, one of the things is like, what's relevant to us? And I feel like I'm a young guy that's living in the society, Western world, and a lot of hot are relevant to me that aren't being discussed. And one of the most important places that we can discuss things the Friday football, which is basically Jumma. Uh, and that's where the whole pilot of the video series started. It's called Funny Things That Jumma. If people start talking about the issues I'm talking about, um, just going up to their local community and start talking about this, people just look at them like they're crazy. Or they may outcast them, or they're going to say this is the black people of our society, or here's a weird guy, or whatever. And, or people will take it offensive. I mean, sometimes when you go to an older uncle, uh, they're going to say, Who are you? <laughs> I've been studying it now for 50 years. How are you? 20? What do you know about this stuff? And plus, people, some of your friends, they're not taking you serious. I want to get this back to the top. I want to get this back to the So I figure if I see it on my camera, you can't really take it personal because I'm not talking to anyone that's stupid. That includes myself as well. I mean, I'm speaking to myself before I now you got your idea, you have your thing. Now, did you guys just sit down and write it all at once, or uh, did you did you always have a piece of paper with you, or I mean, what I mean, what was the process of putting it, put, putting your thoughts together? Things have to be planned. You can if you do things randomly. If you want to try to do things third world, third world style, it's gonna look like third world production. You want to do stuff that that looks like professional, or at least as you can tell from the first couple of videos, sometimes I look yellow for money from the Simpsons. Sometimes I look blue, sometimes it's too much oh, light in one direction, and as you see in my recent videos, the lighting's much better than it was in my earlier videos, and this was a learning curve. But I, I wish I could go back and fix those videos, but it's too much to record and plus it's already out there. But this is why one of the reasons I was saying it was so important for you to learn the stuff ahead of time so you don't waste time and you don't waste effort. But yeah, as we got to the planning stage, I freaked out the first two, and after I got an email from his sister, or was notified from his sister that, hey, um, one of the things you said could come out the wrong way, which was in episode two of Finding Your Spouse Online, I mentioned, uh, your kids have kids? And it was, the, the fun was basically saying that, oh, you never know who you're going to meet online. This is, I thought this was a young sister, and she's actually a grandmother. But it was never meant as a negative way of saying, if you have kids, it's a bad thing. But I can see how we come across the wrong way. Okay. And that was my lesson of freestyle. They can say, hey, you can't freestyle anymore. You have to write out what you're going to be saying and double check because once you put your stuff out there, you can't really pull it back. Because people can extract it and they can start copying it and copying it and copying it. Next thing you know, it's all around the world. And you, have, you can't take that back. You're saying that whenever you make a video, you, you write it out, you script it. And in the process of recording it, um, what what were some challenges that you faced? Well, some of the challenges was to think by myself. Uh, the finder, my my camera did not have a finder, which is very important. The camera the viewfinder can't be flipped over like some of the mini TVs where you can see yourself in the frame. So I recorded the entire episode and I wasn't even in frame. And that that episode no one will ever see because it never got out. Um, another episode I recorded had no audio. 
Once again, there's no cameraman to say, hey, I'll leave. No, your audio is was disconnected while you're moving around. Another one, I forgot to press the record button. <laughs> I forgot if the, if the red light is blinking or not. And it was like, oh, man, I just wasted a whole hour. So it was like, it's craziness, man. I was like, I wish I had a cameraman. But, like, a lot of times people really think there's, there's, a, there's a homo film crew, but there isn't. When, when I'm thinking... I must definitely agree with you. I mean, uh, with with some of the videos that I did for Message Mastery, I had my little sisters helping me out, and uh, they could definitely tell me if something was on screen or not. So yeah, d I definitely agree with you in terms of uh, having somebody helping helping you with the production process. Um, now, once everything was uh, filmed, you had all your material. Now came the whole the, the grueling part of uh, editing editing it and. Uh, Fixing that, fixing, fixing what you recorded. Now, tell me about that. What you, what you experienced and what you learned. Well, editing was like I had to figure out what software and what platform would be the best. It was between PC and Mac. So people have their own preferences. I decided to go. I've always been a PC guy, but I decided to go on Mac on this one. I just felt a little more comfortable using the Final Cut Pro software. So once I started learning the software, um, editing wasn't. It, it took a little bit. It, it, I was very slow at it, but eventually the more and more you do something, the better you get at it and the faster you get at it. But still, it takes a long time to edit, and as you said, it's a grueling process, and it's the part that a lot of people give up on. I mean, the filming part is the fun part, but once you start editing, it's like, oh man, it's like 3 in the morning, I want to go to sleep, but uh, you want to get it done because all the clock people are ready for the next episode to come up. What made you decide on uh, what program? Like you said, you went on a Mac. Mm -hmm. Now, even on the Mac, there are different programs. You know, you have iMe, yeah. iMovie, you have Final Cut. And you have a slew of other third-party programs that, that one can go with. What made you decide which one to get on? Well, I discussed with a bunch of people regarding what's the best software, and a lot of people were just calling me Final Cut, Final Cut, and and same Final Cut Pro, and Final Cut Studio. I'm sorry. And then when I discussed with uh, with people who I know who work at Apple. At the same time, I, I was, when I was at Bridges, everyone was using uh, the same Final Cut. So I decided to go that route. Um, I used to use Premiere before, and people, some people prefer Premiere, some people prefer uh, Final Cut. But Final Cut just seems to be the industry standard when it comes to uh, editing, so I decided to go that route. When you started making the videos initially, did you have in mind that you're going to make it, that you're going to give it to all these hundreds of thousands of people, probably even no. now millions of people? What, what, what? It was actually made for a few friends, and I didn't know that you. The YouTube is not Muslim website. It's not just a Muslim website. You don't go it up on there to get a Muslim audience. And what happened was just a, a few friends told another few friends, and after our third video, we had three thousand views. That so was amazing. And then by the sixth video, we had thirty thousand. And by the 10th video, we had 130,000 views. And by the 14th video, we had a, about a million views. And now today, the videos have, have about 250,000 views each month that come through. So it, it's amazing that people are still watching this. And this is a non-Muslim and, and I th I really didn't think even non-Muslims will be watching. But a lot of, majority of our, a good some of our audience is non-Muslim, including people who are atheists, People who are hardcore Christians and people who are like, have nothing to do with Islam, but because it deals with humor and ethics, they're interested in listening to what it has to say. They don't feel like it's a lecture. So I, I guess that's what pulls some people in. Now, after you, after you did the first season, you completed it. And what what pushed you to start the second season? Because, I mean, did you have in mind that I'm going to do... Well, the, what happened was that I kept getting emails. <laughs> I mean, our inbox was so flooded. I started asking help from other brothers and said, brothers, I just need help with emails. I can't even handle the emails. I mean, it was insanity. I can't tell you how many emails were coming in on a daily basis. And when you have 130,000 viewers, it's just, and the people are just wanting to send a message or send a one-page email, I had emails that were up to six pages long. And like, at the end of the message, the, brother, the guy said, uh, it's 4 a.m. and my wife is telling me I have to go to sleep. Otherwise, I'll continue typing. I'm like, do you know how long it takes to read a six-page email? And then let them respond to all the different questions. I'm like, there's no way I can do this. I spend most of my time responding to emails. And, uh, and a lot of people say, please make more videos. Please make more videos. Please. And I eventually I say, you know what? Okay, if the viewers are going to watch, I will try to make more videos. So that season two started in November of 2000.
Now, what were the lessons, uh, like, visually, you can see season two looks a little bit different from season one. Now, I mean, uh, I'm sure that there were things that you learned while doing season one that you applied into season two. What were those things? Well, one of the things is, like, regarding the lighting. Uh, lighting is a big, big problem. And that's the that's that to make or break your video. Number two is I, I, I went from using a shotgun mic to a wireless mic, which improved the audio. And so, um, the, because when you move away from the camera, if I'm close to it, the audio keeps shifting and changing. And that was too hard to change during editing each time. And uh, it, when I went to wireless mic, it made it more consistent. Um, number three, it was, I was able to know exactly where I am in frame without even looking at the viewfinder anymore because of so much practice and repetition. And editing, I was much, much faster at that point. I was editing by half the time. So, and then now recently for Ask Ali, I decided to add a DVD, uh, one of those main DVD players that connected to my camera. And I can always see exactly when I'm in frame. I can see the audio bars moving. So I can see the mic is working. So it's making it much, much easier. The more you do something, the better you get at it. But again, if someone would have told me a lot of stuff in the beginning, it took myself a lot of time. No, you did season two, and I'm sure you got a lot more emails in season two. And now, just just tell us about the whole process of, I mean, editing video, right? I mean, just just go ahead and, and tell us the story of season two. Well, editing is like when I film, I film like an, I I sit there and I film about an hour of footage. Sometimes I'm freestyling, sometimes it's by script, sometimes it's a combination of both. A lot of times it deals with a, a, a combination of both, and. After about an hour of footage, I take only about seven minutes of my favorite parts and I make it to a video. So, uh, there's so much stuff that people never watch. Sometimes a friend will come over and says, well, uh, you see me editing it. He says, this stuff is so funny. And I said, no one will ever see this stuff because it never made the final cut. The thing is, I can make a 30-minute video, but that's not my goal. I want to make it short and sweet, straight to the point, inshallah. And that's why the formula seems to be working. Like a five minutes and seven minutes videos seems to be working. And, and that's one, another thing you also learn. You learn how long the video should be enough to cat, capture the attention of the person, but long enough to get a message across. You're saying that you basically went on and on for about an hour? Yeah. Wow, okay. For about seven minutes. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Now, now, what were... No, I just go randomly. I just speak randomly all the time. Like sometimes they film my videos, you see me laughing and just talking. Like, what are they talking about? I'm actually there's no script. I just I just stopped reading the script and I just I just start freestyling. <laughs> season two ended, and there was actually a, quite a bit of a gap between season two and the new series Ask Baba Ali. Now I'm sure there was a lot of things happening, like you touring the city and things like that. Uh, I mean, did you t did you start touring while season two was? Uh, going on or did you start that yeah, after during, okay yeah during season one i did 10 videos in 10 weeks and at that time we were just building momentum of no one really it really wasn't that, it really wasn't that popular yet i mean only, only about 130,000 views and then by the time season two came around the videos had gone we give we give a few months before season two started and by that time we started getting newspapers and articles written about some of films and left the rock getting phone calls from everyone from the BBC to name it. And they're just all interested in talking about this, about these videos. So that's what started next. People say, hey, can you come to our event? Can you come here? Can you come there? And next thing I know, I'm doing events from across the United States, but as well as Canada, the UK many times. Plus invitations are coming from all around the world, everywhere from Egypt to Saudi Arabia to name it, to Australia. And I, a lot of them I couldn't go because I have a normal life. Well, somewhat normal. I'm still <laughs> going, but I still have somewhat of a normal life. Like, I have to go to work. But like, people, people go to work on the weekends. Like, hey, what'd you do? Oh, I walked my dog. I did this. I, what'd you do? I told you. Like, what? So I was like, yeah, I went to, like, how many times I've done a six-city tour across the UK? I mean, these six days, I've done that twice. I performed in front of an audience as low as about 30 people and as large as 35,000 people live. I've been on, uh, I've won numerous film contests. I've been on television. Uh, I've been casted for reality TV shows. I've been like, famous. And just recently it was a USA Today article and 
after that, I just got a, about a few weeks ago, I got interviewed by the New York Times, and that guy's working on that article. So, BBC, BBC Radio, uh, The Guardian, it's just left and right, and because I've gone to all these events, eventually, a lot of my events, I'll keep telling people, no, I can't go. I seriously wanted to go, but I can't go, and I felt so bad that I had to tell people I can't go. So, um, I, I ended up doing with season two, one video a month. And after season two was done, I had so many four days. I, it was so hard. Like, I'll give you my example of my schedule. Last week, I went to work from Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I met Monday and Tuesday. On Wednesday, I went to Boston to do Northeastern University. Thursday, I was in Boston, Boston University. Friday, I was in uh, University of Connecticut. I flew down there. And on Saturday, I flew to New York, Northern New York, to do Syracuse. And on Sunday, I was in Los Angeles. So today, I'm back at work. I'm driving back from work today. I'm almost home. And uh, on Friday, I'm flying to Utah. On, on Saturday, I'm at South Carolina. And in the afternoon, I have a conference call for Muslim Converse from, from North Carolina. I'm calling and now I'm I'm back to Los Angeles again. So my schedule has been insane since it just started. I'm sure throughout all this whole process, there were definitely some memorable moment, moments. So you mentioned reality show. Tell us about that. Tell us some things that you learned in that that we could probably take away with. Well, so you know how they tell you that reality people here in Los Angeles are fake? I mean, the film industry and the video people? Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't think of how many fake people I came across. I mean, I don't know who these people are. They will call me, Ali, we love you. Fantastic. You're doing great. You're doing great. I'm for you. They're always calling me up to do, like, PR, like, public relations. Ali, we just want to let you know, we're thinking of you. Fantastic. You're doing a great job. As long as, until I sign their contract. Once I sign their contract, is Ali who? Who's Ali? Like, <laughs> and this is a joke. Humble Lai never joined the film industry and never went that direction. And that's one of the reasons I want to do things uh, my way and informally. Because that industry is really, really shady people. I mean, people sell their souls to get into that industry. They like, eat, kill, do whatever they have to do to make it to the top. And I, I didn't want to go that direction. And I think there's a way to do things in a halal way. And success is from a lot of people not from them. So um, when the reality TV show didn't work out, half the law didn't, um, a lot of other things came across my way. So, and that half the law worked out very, very well. And it helped Uma film. And that money has never been an incentive for what Uma film is good for me. I have all these videos I've done and all the events I've done, none of the money has really gone to me. All the money that I've taken for doing events, I donate it and give it to somebody else that, that needs it more than I do. And even the money that I generated from uh, winning all these different film contests, I'm putting, all, I'm putting it all back into my film so we can get this movie done, inshallah. So, although we had about $1,300 of money put in from different uh, uh, of our different viewers, I'm putting another ten thousand dollars in my own funds, in, inshallah, um, so we can get the movie going, inshallah. Now, Ali, you mentioned your movie, and uh, it seems pretty exciting. First, uh, just go ahead, tell us what prompted you to do a movie. You were doing well, online videos, and now you jump to a movie. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I I think I I've done enough videos, alhamdulillah. And the idea for Uma film was never about to make a, uh, to sit in front of a, uh, to sit in front of a camera and just talk. The reason we call Uma film is we want to make films. <laughs> but Ali, Baba Ali videos. So what happened was, uh, I decided that I'd be making these videos for a certain amount of time, and after a certain amount of time, I'm going to actually go back to my original intentions to make a movie. Um, a lot of times when you start trying to do something, people are going to be negative around you. They're going to say, that's impossible. You'll never do it. And you have, fun, the funny thing is we have so many of these type of people. But one of the things you have to do is try to ignore these people because these people who are pessimistic, they, can't, they don't want to do it and they don't want to see you doing it. I don't understand why, but for whatever reason, you have to ignore them and ignore those type of comments and then go after your dream, inshallah. Because if Allah subhanahu ta'ala wills it, it can happen. You just have to put in the effort and make it happen, inshallah. So um, as regards to what prompted me to make a movie, um, it's a challenge, it's amazing, and I think that I can get a message across. There's a movie called The My Big Fat Greek Wedding. And in that movie, um, it's basically about two, uh, a, a Greek lady marrying an American person and, and all the humor that comes from this. 
they have a message in the movie as well. So this was an independent film that no one bought. Not Universal Pictures, not Paramount, nobody decided to buy it. And only one Canadian company decided to buy it for $200,000. That movie made $300 million in distribution. And it was one of the biggest and most popular independent films out there and eventually made it to the main film, uh, to the main movie theaters. And this was on a small budget. But our, our thing is we must go, we, we individually, none of us have $10 million to spend. But as a whole, if we all work together, we can come up with something big. If we each put, if 5,000 of us put $20 a piece, we have $100,000. With that $100,000, we can make a movie that we, we can see in the independent theaters, inshallah. And it's very doable. But individually, we can't do it. But as a group, we can do it, inshallah. So I think if I, now that there's a large audience watching, inshallah, I want to make a website, I want to make it, I want to make a script, and I want to pitch it to the Ummah, inshallah. If the Ummah is interested and we can work together, I think we can make a movie that makes a positive impact on the way the, the world sees Muslims, inshallah. I mean, you mentioned, uh, it's funny how you talked about, you know, the pessimistic type of people. The, uh, it reminds me of uh, Mike Uslan, he came to my school, he's the executive producer of uh, all the Batman movies and everything that's the Batman on uh, television and in theaters. And he was telling us that when he was initially trying to produce the first Batman film, uh, it was actually uh, it was actually ten years before he started uh, development of that movie. Ten years before the first Batman movie got made, he went to he pitched it to every single one of the theaters, and every single one of them basically gave him the boot and kicked him out the door. Finally, somebody by the name of Tim Burton, uh, some of you may have heard of him, uh, you know, liked the idea and uh, and got some support for it, and they made the film. And uh, in the end, he, all of those studio executives that he had pitched to called him back saying, you know, we always believed in you, we trusted you, uh, and we knew that you would make it, and, uh, and we want you to work with us. And, uh, and he was basically saying that in, in the end, if, if you have faith, you ignore all the pessimistic talk and the optimistic talk, I mean, you believe that you can do it, you have faith then you will come out on top and be, uh, be okay. And it's interesting that you mentioned that. Even you experienced uh, the same thing. Now, uh, be before I get further into the details of the film, what you have planned, I want you to talk a little bit about uh, the story that uh, apparently uh, that I hear just got finished editing uh, is Tomorrow Never Comes. Tell us a little bit about that, wh how it started and whatnot. Well, a long time ago, uh, when Uma Films first started, I decided to write a script to get the ball rolling. And I realized that in order for you to practice making a film, you can't expect to come out and make the first film and expect to get into the theater. You take a lot, just like you practice everything else, you need to practice um, filming movies. And what I mean by filming a movie, you want an entire team to work together. A lot of us brothers, we have no film experience, and everyone over here was pretty much in the same shoes I was. I mean, no film experience. We don't know how to even use the camera. <laughs> we can't even use, we don't know how to write a script, we don't know how to do anything. All we're doing is kind of read on the internet, take a book, read it here, read it there, and we'll all kind of figure it out. But we need something to practice. So I decided to make a practice film and write, I decided to write a script. Um, I got some help from a friend, and we, and we wrote a film called Tomorrow Never Comes. And the film is about this guy who wakes up one day, and he wakes up deaf. He can't hear, and he can't, uh, uh, he can't see. So eventually he starts thinking about uh, life, he thinks about reflect upon what he's been acting like and the way he's been conducting himself and he realizes how arrogant he was and how his arrogance blinded him from way before he lost his sight and way before he lost his, uh, his hearing and way before he lost his sight. And his arrogance blinded him and made him deaf. So um, he wakes up from his dream and he doesn't realize if it's a dream or not. So his friend knocks on the door and tells him that, uh, he tells his friend that I'm going to find tomorrow I'm going to change the show up. The friend asks him, why are you waiting until tomorrow? And he tells him, because um, there's always a tomorrow. Then he, gets, then he dies. Because tomorrow never came for him. The movie is about being pessimistic, as many of us look from door sometimes. We always think, okay, tomorrow I'll do it. Tomorrow I'll do it. But what if tomorrow never comes? So that was the idea and the message behind the movie. And that one, it was very simple because it really deals with one main character and his friend and a few reflections and it was simple enough to move to film, and it's about a 10 minute movie, inshallah. So I decided to give my camera to a few friends to try to record it. Unfortunately, they failed at recording it after two months, after three months of recording, 
they had barely any footage. So I decided to take my camera back and that's when the reminder series started. I wanted to film something using my equipment. Well, back in last August, I got a, I, I met this brother at a book conference in Canada. He came up to me and, and his name is Ed Dan. He's now the director of the project. Um, he came up to me and said, I want to, are you even working on any projects? I want to work with you. I said, currently I'm working on season two of the Oma film and uh, that's pretty much keeping me busy, but I did write a, I did write a, uh, a film call tomorrow never comes. Did you want to film it? He said, yes, I do. And we got some other phone calls from other film people. And they all said, we want to work on this film too. So, and that took his part. And he worked with his brother who's producing it. His name is Yusuf. He's, he's part of Oma film. They all worked on it together. A bunch of people who never met each other before. Who met only on the internet. They all flew down to Los Angeles. Filmed it in a few weekends. And on April 4th, they're about to release it, inshallah. Now, I want you guys to keep this in mind. The film is only filmed with only seven hundred dollar budget. Only seven hundred bucks. These actors have never acted before. A lot of the people have zero film experience. And the the, the crew is like the skeleton crew, just a few people. But we want to show the Opa what we can do for seven hundred bucks. Because if we can do this for seven hundred bucks, imagine what we can do with the hundred thousand dollar budget in Opa. So that was it that was the idea of the best Opa. And this is a, a low budget movie with people who have no experience whatsoever. If we can do it for, if we can do this, imagine what we can do for a hundred thousand, inshallah. So that's basically a, 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 a underlying message for the people who are watching. Mashallah. Well, since you did not do the directing uh, and the filming of Tomorrow Never Comes, where uh, I mean, I know that you were on set uh, some of the some of the time. Uh, just tell us about what you saw. Tell us about some things that you may have learned uh, in the process that you could share with us. Well, one of the things I've noticed is that um, it's amazing, first of all, how Muslims work together. I, I've seen how Muslims sometimes work together and they're arguing and stuff like that. But if, if Muslims who are organized and work together, it's, it's amazing things to be accomplished. And when we're unorganized, either good in Muslims or not Muslims, it can be chaos. Um, some of the shootings were more organized than the other shootings, and and still committed. These guys woke up at Fajr and they slept like at midnight. And they're filming the whole time. Um, a lot of times, some some things they made mistakes and they had to refilm. But other times, they did really really well and they came out well. But one of the things I learned is planning is very very important. I mean, you plan out. They plan out. The second time they start filming, they plan out every single scene, every single frame where the guy will be standing, where the camera will be where the lighting will be, and they brought up even more trained people on, on staff to help help out. They brought a director of, director of photography to help out with the lighting, and I have to love things came out pretty well. Now, I haven't even seen the final footage yet, and I can't take credit for the movie because I didn't... The, the producer was Yusuf and Anand, and this Rami was nice yeah. for directing, but the rest of the team was amazing. So, I mean, everyone, everyone put a lot of effort in, and they did a great job. Based on the rough cut that I saw, it was done pretty well. So. Definitely, when Muslims get together, <laughs> these things can happen, especially when you have the Barak of Allah SWT, uh, behind us. Now, uh, going back to uh, going back to the uh, movie that you want, uh, tell us some, tell us something about it in terms of what you have planned. Uh, we so far you told us that you know we have uh, one planned budget is a hundred thousand uh, dollars, and uh, but what what's the do you have a story in mind already or is it still in development or what's the idea? The, the basic story is about this guy who goes around trying to get married, and I think the whole marriage process is hilarious because there's so much stuff that happens that's so funny even that most of them both no both most of the non Muslims to watch because for Muslims they can relate to it because it's the marriage process it's both the marriage process. And for non Muslims, they can relate to it because on the surface level, it's men and women relationships. I mean, there's always that story, even in non Muslim movies, where the guy is looking for the, his future girl or his, his other half, and it's that whole pursuit that makes it so interesting. Well, in this movie, basically, the main character is going around trying to find his future wife, inshallah. And he goes from everything from online matchmaking to arranged marriage from his parents to him. And each one ends up as a comical disaster uh, because he realizes oh, how much culture has impacted his his uh, his ummah, his people. And some of the some of the things are really hilarious, and they're so true because I actually went through. <laughs> I can even make this stuff up. 
And it's basically the same sense of humor you see in my reminder videos, but instead of a guy sitting in his chair, I'm actually in the real world. And out there and doing the real stuff that everyone else does. Everything from going to a halal matchmaking uh, seminar to like meeting the parents and having been interviewed by the Wally. And, and everything seems to go completely wrong. At the very end, the main character finds a, a sister and a family who seems to be really, really happy. And uh, he realizes they're happy because his song came first for him, for them, instead of his song coming second. So that, that's the turning point of the movie, and it has, it has the moral of the movie as well. Is this story inspired by true events, uh, either by your life or somebody else's, or is this stuff that, uh, or, or is it like a collection of different things that you've ex you've seen? It's, it's inspired by true events, and I was speaking to a different director, and originally I've been looking for a, a main actor to film this, and every time I go to a director, like, Ali, you should be it. I'm like, dude, I'm not a direct, I'm not an actor, he says, don't worry, we'll, we'll figure something out, just be yourself. And I said, okay, I can try, but I don't think I'm an actor. But he said, just do what you do in your videos and they'll be fine. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, at this time, one of the directors I've been uh, discussing with, he's like, Ali, you should be the main actor, not just for marketing reasons, but you've actually gone through it, so you can explain in detail exactly what happened. So I've actually approached his sister for marriage, and funny things have happened. I've actually been interviewed by a future father-in-law. Funny things have happened. I've traveled across the globe looking for my other half, and the funniest things have happened. So, and honestly, I, I've never seen these things on television or even similar stories. So I think it'll be original and it'll be different. So imagine the movie Borat, where the, where the, where the main character is, instead of the main character being the strange one and society being normal, um, the, the, the main character is a normal person, but his society, which is in this case the Muslim community, is the strange one. And they're strange because they're, they've kind of like shied away from his mom. And, and adopt the other things as their priority in life. Uh, when are, are you intending to actually start the uh, production of this movie? Well, currently I'm, I'm in the process and the script is being started this week. I have all the ideas in my head and I need to get them on paper. And uh, to make a proper movie, you have to get a proper script writer to, to make a script. So what I want to do is put everything in my own words and then take it to a person who's a professional um, I spoke to a man who knows upcoming people who are script writers at USC, um, film students, and show hope there'll be future film bookies, script writers for the, for the, for the industry, and I can catch them before they become major labels and they start charging too much money. But some, <laughs> some film people I've, 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 we've, we've come across, they charge up to $10,000 for a script. But then again, uh, the guy who wrote signs charged $5 million, and I mean, he made $5 million off the script. Money is not in my inspiration for this movie whatsoever. My inspiration is to get a message out in Shalom, and I have to love that's been my inspiration since day one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it successful since day one. And again, as I mentioned before, I'm just an average guy. Uh, so if I can do it, anyone can do it. Before we start Q&A, Ali, do you have any um, anything that comes to mind that you want to say? Um, I, I just want to, like, the main thing for me is that I've mentioned this more than once. Um, I'm, I'm, a lot of times people look at me like, okay, this guy must be doing acting or he must be doing this or whatever. I'm just being myself. And I think if someone was actually in the room, I wouldn't be as comfortable as playing my different characters or just saying the, uh, or venting or, or going on to my rants and whatever. But because I'm alone, it's kind of like when people are alone in the shower, they think they can sing, um, but they can't sing. It's kind of like that. When I'm alone, I can joke around much more. So I never know what you can do until you draw that camera or you go after whatever your passion is, poetry or, or whatever, and then try it. I mean, one of the brothers I know, he was, we were just these really close friends and we used to hang out together and then one day he starts writing poetry and alhamdulillah, he just recently wrote a book. He never knew it was in, he never knew it was in him. You know, I wrote two books of poetry and got my stuff published as well and I never knew it was in me. But sometimes you have to try something and then you never know if it's going to succeed or not. So whatever your passion is, see that video or anything else, you have to give it a try, inshallah, and then of course make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, now we're going we're gonna to open up the floor to Q&A. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Ali, you still there? Ali? Baba Ali, hello. What's your question? 
Maybe if you um, came in the call late, I could I could answer it. Um, well, I was wondering if um, Brother Ali was married. Oh yeah, he is married. Oh he is? Yes. Uh, alhamdulillah. Mashallah, alhamdulillah. Was that your only question? Um, no, the second one was if not, <laughs> if he was considering, but answer the first question. Zakallah khair. Well, yeah, okay. Well, yeah. Ali, you back? Yeah, I'm back. Okay, cool, cool. Ali's back. All right. Yeah, your first your first question was uh, if you're married. I already answered yes. Maybe I'm wrong. Go ahead and tell them if you're married or not. Yes, I am married. <laughs> okay. Mashallah. <laughs> Next question. Uh, um, I have two questions, so feel free to just answer one of them. I know we're probably tight on time. Um, the first one is how, like, with your experience, how necessary is it? Do you think? Um, to pursue like a formal kind of program, formal film studies, in order to produce a quality kind of pr production. So if our goal is to put something out that meets Hollywood standards, how possible is it to do that without any formal training? And you know, have you ever felt like you're at any disadvantage um, because you don't have that training? Uh, and then how you overcome that. And then my second question is just about the kind of films um, that uh, we're producing. So uh, specifically when it comes to his de depicting historical events, um, what are kind of, I guess, the pros and the cons of going for that kind of film as opposed to like a modern drama or a modern comedy? Um, I'm guessing the first kind would need more resources, but it could potentially be a lot, I guess, very moving and inspirational if it's done in the right way. So I'm thinking of movies like Gladiator and Braveheart. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to see what your thoughts were as to genres. Um, thanks, thanks for your question. Uh, so the first one is, like, uh, individually with Caligo so far. Even with my videos, um, the reason is you see them as simple as they are, Alhamdulillah, even the simple way it's been working, but the reason they're, they're limited so much is because I'm by myself. But as a team, you can accomplish so much more. So, um, if, regarding your first question, I mean, you, if you're, if you're going to do it by yourself, you're very, very limited, and you only do so much, you only go so far. If you work as a team, you'll be amazed at how much stuff you can do, even with the uh, inexpensive stuff that's out there. Um, a lot of these films is, um, the original content isn't really out there for most of If you see some of our films, we see that we're making parodies of everything that we see in the mainstream. If there is Survivor, we'll make most of the Survivor. If it's, uh, if it's a song, it's up, what we saw had a farm is Old Mahmoud had a farm. When you come out with that kind of stuff, that's what makes it really cheap. It's not necessarily just the film quality, but it's content that's so important. I mean, if you watch my videos, it's just a guy sitting in a chair. Nothing, no special effects or nothing else, and then you expect by the time he, come out, he comes out with his 30th video, he must have something new, but he doesn't. So, but people still watch. Sometimes those things work. So as a regards of, like, production, I, I mean, hopefully it shows the law to uh, elaborate more, but you can do all decent stuff with just limited equipment. You just need to plan it well and just have a good team work around and people that know what they're doing. Take advantage. Take advantage of the equipment that you have to the map. So, uh, as regards the second question regarding like making big budget movies, um, just like the studios, it's, it's, it's money that's the big issue. And of course, you have enough money for anything. You can make, you can make just like as big as Gladiator and everything else. But the problem is, who's going to fund the hundred million dollars or ten million or fifty million? The movie, uh, the message cost ten million dollars in 1979 to make. It doesn't look that, that complicated, but there's a lot of costs that are involved when you think comes to making a film. So um, a lot of the stuff we have to be realistic to say, okay, what can we do? And based on what we can we do, let's see if we can come up with a script and make it as professional as possible. So um, hopefully your your question will be answered based on the example of what we're doing for Tomorrow Never Comes, which is our first film. And I can't take any more credit other than writing the script, but Basically, the brothers got together, and for seven hundred dollars, they came up with a, a film, and they put it together. And with people have no experience whatsoever, and they're basically learning on the spot. 
So hopefully when that comes out in about two weeks, you can take a look at that and say, okay, this is what I can do for about $700 budget. I also want to, uh, I want to add to that also uh, in terms of Hollywood, just, just, for, just for some figures of uh, people who have made it. Um, one example that I can think of, one name that you may have heard is Robert Rodriguez. He's the individual who produced uh, the film uh, Desperado. He's also produced Sin City um, and a couple other films. Now, obviously, so some of these films are not Islamically ex uh, appropriate. Uh, but just to give you an idea, his first film, El Mariachi, which is actually a prequel to the movie Desperado, he he made for seven thousand dollars, and Colombia actually bought it for eighty thousand dollars, and they made millions of dollars off of it. Um, another example is Michael Moore. Uh, he's somebody who made uh, you know Fahrenheit 9/11, for example for five million dollars and it's grow and it's still grossing many million dollars beyond that. Uh, a third example I can give you is the film Super Size Me. This individual who made the movie about McDonald's and how unhealthy the food is, it cost him sixty thousand dollars and until today he's made over twenty eight million dollars from that film. So that, that's just an idea of the fact that even if you can keep things as simple as Ani was talking about, but yet the content of what, you, uh, what you're saying is, um, uh, is good, and plus you can make the production quality look like it's high production quality, you know, making a $10,000 film look like a $10 million film, it can be done. And thus, uh, that's what pro uh, uh, studios and distributors buy. So, uh, Do you mind I, I just ask a quick follow-up? Sure, go ahead. Um, would you, I'm wondering if you'd recommend at all, uh, like one thing I'm considering once I'm done with the degree I'm working on now is to start a program in film studies. And so I'm wondering if you think it'd be more efficient to just, uh, like get your hands dirty and just practice as opposed to going through formal studies. In, in, you know, like from, from my understanding, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a marketing student. Uh, and I and I know a lot of filmmaking students. The key thing, and and they've said this themselves, the key thing to making movies is making movies. In film school, in a short amount of time, they teach you all the stuff, but you don't necessarily have to apply it all. It's, it's very difficult to have to apply everything. Uh, that's that's why when you make films, that's when you're actually learning. That's when you actually uh, develop. So if you want to enter into a film program, you have to ask yourself, is the investment of time and money, is it going to be something that you feel that will, will have return? But at the same time, you also have to ask yourself, are you going to be implementing the, uh, what, what's going to be given to you? Because if you implement it, you will have returns. But at the same time, if you don't, then, uh, I mean, there's so many people, um, millions and millions of students graduate uh, with a film degree, but how many of them uh, become successful. It, it's just a matter of uh, applying what you learn and, and being dedicated to what you do. Uh, uh, how are you brothers? Mashallah, very nice work. Uh, I got, just got to know brother uh, Baba Ali. I wish to watch his movies in the last uh, few weeks. So, mashallah, very, very, very beautiful work. Uh, I just have one suggestion or one comment to that. Uh, I don't know, I saw YouTube now is becoming a very important tool for Dawa. So I was wondering if, and I guess the, 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 the money needed to make a, a YouTube movie, five minute movie, Movies, I don't think it's going to be that big number. So I was wondering if you can make a company, uh, especially that uh, you are you going to start teaching uh, some Muslims how to do movies, if you can make like a, a collective work by making a movie dedicated to YouTube, I think it's going to be cheap, very effective. YouTube now is becoming a very effective do, uh, tool in Dawa. Uh, I don't know if you are considering this or what your plan for, for the next, uh, next step. Also, the other thing that, uh, I don't know, I think, are you planning to do, uh, like, online courses for uh, how to make a, a video or how to make a short movie for YouTube or what's your ideas about that? Thank you. Okay, inshallah. So, uh, actually, the, the brother who's on the interview, his name is, uh, he's the one who's putting the um, uh, video together to explain how to make a uh, film, you know, so you can do what I'm doing, inshallah. So, um, will make it easier so you don't have to go through the same process I went through. Um, but as regards of making films for YouTube, yeah, that's what I've been doing. I mean, it's pretty much, uh, 
little or no budget for you to be able to pull that off because all you need is a basic big camera, uh, some time and an imagination to put it together. So um, if I can do it, as I said, anyone can do it. Um, but more importantly, as the law said, confidence is a big, big, big deal. But the law, if you want to explain better regarding like what your your program is going to do in mastery, I think I'll Yeah, I'll, I'm going to do that. Actually, I'll do that right now. This call in itself was hosted by uh, a program that I'm starting uh, called Message Mastery. It, it's, its goal is to equip 200 brothers and sisters, developing writing, producing, editing, uh, and marketing and uh, distributing videos online. And trust me, YouTube is not the only thing. YouTube is actually less than, uh, is, is about 30% of all online video. You actually have a lot more people uh, and a lot more services out there that people share videos through. You have Daily Motion, you have, uh, you have Blip TV, you have, um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of them. That, there's literally close to 100 different video sharing programs uh, that are socially uh, marketed out there right now. And, uh, and uh, inshallah, in this program, I'm going to be teaching everything um, in, in terms of how to uh, how to get get to that. Um, and this is why this is actually calling itself is a, a way to promote uh, the program out there. If you haven't heard about it? It's messagemastery.com. Uh, so that way, if you guys want to get in on the program, then uh, I would suggest go to messagemastery.com right now and uh, and sign yourself up. I hope that's answered the question. For the sake of time. Uh, we have less than uh, 20 minutes on the call. I'm going to just go ahead and move on to the next person. Uh, number four. Well, yeah, no problem. Sometimes it's hard to find the courage to uh, move, make make movies like these. So uh, any tips on how to find that courage? And also that when, inshallah, you do get fame, how to uh, control yourself and keep yourself in the front of Well, uh, as regards to courage, are you talking about uh, being able to talk about those type of issues, or are you talking about, like, just sitting in front of a camera? No, no, because, like, um, the criticism you get from other people, oh, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, how to deal with that, and... Oh, okay, um, <laughs> well, the thing is, like, you're always, if, you, if you're going to get a million views, you're always going to find people that are going to hate you. Some people hate you because they just want to hate you. And other people that like you just because they want to like you no matter what you say. And then, then you're going to find people in the middle that are going to listen to, listen, and they're going to judge you based on what you said. So you can't let people's uh, reaction discourage you. I mean, like the earlier comment I was giving for my big fat Greek wedding, uh, they, everyone told that guy no. And just like uh, the last in the beginning, everyone told the guy from uh, uh, make it. Yeah. So, both those films succeeded, huh, So, I mean, that was that. What was your second second part of the question? Um, and when you do get fame, how do you deal with that fame that you don't you don't get carried away with it, and how do you stay in the front of the Very good question. One of the ones I try to make is is ask a lot of my to take any arrogance out of my heart and to put me around companions and projects that bring me closer to him. Because this fame and this popularity can get quickly to people's heads. So back in last year, I was in a conference in uh, one of the cities, I won't mention which one, but I went back in the entertainment session and I, and I met some book painters, and I was just starting off. And I was starting to get more and more popular, so I went to get advice from Muslim entertainers, saying that, hey, look, I'm starting to get more and more famous, what can I do to... You, the exact question you just asked me, what you do to prevent yourself from becoming arrogant or letting this stuff get to your head. And I talked to these guys and, and look at they already got to their head. So I was like, you know what, I think if they go with the flow, that was what the guy told me. That was his advice, which was not really any advice. So, um, I, 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 I pretty much figured, like, I have to do a couple of things to, to keep myself in check. Number one is, like, um, I, have to I didn't... Personally, there's nothing wrong with taking money off of projects. But my thing was I decided to give the money away to different people that uh, that, did, that didn't have the resources I did. So that was one of the things. So even though I charge to go to events, I, I don't give the money to myself. Number two is like, um, regarding like the popularity and stuff like that, I don't give autographs, sit down on, on, and just sign my name away and pretend like this stuff is gone to my head because my signature is not worth any more than your signature. 
Well, let me go and check if it's not worth anything. So in one of my videos, uh, I, I realized how important this whole arrogance thing is. And that's why my first movie, Tomorrow Never Comes, is based on the whole arrogant issue. And one of the videos for season two is about arrogant people. So I thought these were very relevant issues that we don't really hear too much about in Friday Hood Buzz. But arrogance is something that even people who are knowledgeable have to be watched out for. So something that you have to always keep yourself in check with. So Satan, when he didn't bow to, uh, when he didn't listen to Allah Subhanahu wa Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's command, it was his arrogance that made him think he was better than everyone else. That he thought he was better than Adam. Not than everyone else. He thought he was better than Adam. His arrogance that made him think that I'm not going to bow to, the, to and even listen to my Creator because I'm made of fire. His arrogance is really, really close to the hellfire, and look what happened to, to Satan. So something we have to always keep ourselves in check. This, this Oma film is popularity and just being a celebrity is nothing more than a trial for me. It has been a trial and it's a very difficult trial because I have to always keep my intentions straight. So, I hope that answers your question. Just to, uh, I just want to add on that something really quickly. One thing to understand, money and fame and power and all these things are all magnifiers. They magnify what's already in your heart. And the key thing is to always, always purify yourselves. And, you know, the Hadith of the Prophet uh, where he said that fear Allah wherever you are, be kind to others, and follow every bad deed with a good deed. You got to keep that up and make and, and make it a motto of your life. And the whole, and that it's very important that you always clean what's inside your heart. Because the whole thing is, when it comes to the when it comes to making videos, when people see you, you're gonna be. I mean, people gonna see you, and and, and sometimes uh, if if you have things that are not showing out right now because you don't have the elements that are magnifiers, they may come out, and that's why it's very important to do that. Wa alaikum salam. I live in Atlanta, and I've tried meeting up with other uh, with other Muslims with the same passion. But the problem is that um, all the Muslims that I met up with for the video editing and video effects, they're not as special as I thought they would. So I ended up pairing with um, non-Muslims, professional non-Muslims that work in Cartoon Network and Turner Box. And um, I have experience with camera, you know, lighting, shape, Maya, Final Fantasy Studio. I feel like every minute being passed is a great potential being lost. So when I work independently, I try to get my skills towards the stem. But I wanted to know how can I use my skills in a movie network with no compromise on quality, like Hollywood, PBS style, you know? What if we don't necessarily need as much practice and we want to go ahead and jump in because we already have... Um, well, well, the thing is, like, if, if you're saying, what if we don't need that much practicing, we just want to jump in, is that what you're asking? Yes, yes. Okay, so the thing is, like, you have to jump in. I mean, one of the things, actually, what Bilal was discussing earlier regarding Robin Rock, uh, actually read his book. And one of the first things he said, I think, in his book is like, if you're talking about filmmaking, put this book down. Go pick up a camera instead. Because the only way to get good at filmmaking is, is to be filmmaking. Reading 10 books will make you a filmmaker. You have to pick up the camera and practice and practice and practice. And that's, and that's how you really learn. That's the real online experience that you, that you pick up. So, um, if you think you have the, the, the expertise or the technical skills to do it, and all you need is content to make good, inshallah. So I, I say go for it. I mean, I didn't have the technical side of it. I had the ideas, but I didn't know how to do it. So, and right now, I just, I learned and just enough for me to get my content out. And that's basically turning on the record button, sitting in a chair and talking and moving around. And that's how simple my thing is. But I'm going to the simplicity work. So, if you have the tech, technical background, it's all wrong. You don't necessarily have to work with both get things going. You you don't want to compromise, so if you don't, so that way you have to, you don't want to compromise. So in, so in order for you not to compromise, you have to get charged, inshallah. Especially when you think with non Muslims because they may have their own agenda. But if they want to work with you, or or more power to you, inshallah, and get the power one. Work with non Muslims in our last far never come. Our director of photography was not was a non Muslim. But they were a benefit to us, and they, they can help us, and at the same time, their incentive was to build their their, uh, their portfolio. So, there's nothing wrong with working out with non-Muslims. And I think sometimes non-Muslims are more dependable than Muslims, unfortunately. Assalamu alaikum to both Brother Bilal and Brother Ali. Wa alaikum salam. You guys are doing so jazakallah khair for all your work, and keep it up, mashallah. My question here is regarding making the video. 
So mm-hmm. this is, you know, different, many folks to address whatever mm-hmm. issues that you want. So it's like you guys have the 10 minute videos, then Brother Vida, you worked on a documentary, and maybe you're aware of like different lectures. What is the time, time slot? Like how much time do you need for like a script, recording, editing, things like that? And how much time do you have to put into it? As well as like any ratio. For example, Brother Adi said one hour of recording comes up to like a 10 minute video. So like what is the ratio of how much time you put into making a video and what the final result is? is that what well, uh, it takes me about a few hours to come up with ideas for a script. I, I don't try to rush into things. Sometimes I have no ideas for one or two weeks, and sometimes I can write two scripts in one day. So it all depends on inspiration, and certain things, certain things happen to me that week. Um, as regards to filming, it takes me about 15 to 20 minutes to set up all my equipment, add another 15 to 20 minutes to break down all my equipment and put it away, add an hour film the entire thing, another hour to upload the video, um, capture the video onto my computer, and then editing-wise, it takes, for every hour, it takes, it used to take me about, for every minute of video, it takes me about an hour of editing, and now, because of so many cuts, but now I think I can do about half that time. So, a 10-minute video will take me about five hours to edit. Just to, just to add on to that, I mean, I'll tell you right now, uh, from, uh, from my experience, the um, like for example, with the message mastery videos, the first the first one that I did from idea to distribution took about 26 hours. The second one from idea to distribution took about 40 hours uh, total. And we're talking about maybe less than 10 minute video. Tufan, the documentary that I'm working on. Uh, for those of you who want to more, know more information about it, go to Tufan T U F A A N movie dot com. That movie, I mean that film in itself. I mean I have over 60 hours of footage on that that I'm working with, uh, and I started that. Uh, back in uh, back in April, and I'm still working on it part time. Uh, so that can give you an idea of how much time it takes. A feature documentary uh, by Frederick Wiseman. Uh, he's somebody who is known as the Dean of Documentary Filmmakers. He started. Uh, I mean, he'll make a movie. It'll he'll have about a hundred hours of footage in it, and development time maybe a year to two years. Uh, and we're talking, you know, in the industry, a year to two years development time, uh, about a hundred hours of filming over uh, over a period of a month, and then six to uh, six to eight months of editing, and then you have the distribution marketing time that can be however long according to your uh, campaign. But I hope that uh, that that helps gives you a ballpark figure as to how long it takes. Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm Vicki. Um, Ali, I am a new revert, uh, many years in Christianity. Um, I'm very interested in getting truth um, and putting it out, and I'm not sure exactly where to start. I have writing skills, I'm creative. Um, I'm not sure if I should actually implement it or if I should stick with um, writing. Do you have any suggestions? Um, where to start? Well, I, I noticed that some people are good at some things and other people are better than other things. I know a Muslim guy who's, who's a reaper as well. And he's really, really good at poetry. And, and he's, I mean, certain people are very, very good at writing. Other people are very, very good at poetry. Other people are good at painting. Each person has a lot of fun class and has a skill. So you want to take advantage of your skill set and and work with other people to put something together, inshallah. Or you can even do things individually, like if you're writing, you can do everything from writing a blog to writing. No. Is that someone live? Hello? Somebody's uh, phone has gone busy. Hello, Vicky? Yes, I'm here. Okay, yeah. Uh, whoever that is, please go ahead and press star six. Okay, uh, yeah, Ali, just go ahead and finish off your question. Oh, man. Okay, hold up one second. I'm just going to mute everyone. Okay, uh, Sister Vicky and Ali, go ahead and press star six. Okay. Okay, Ali, you there? Ali, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. I hope you didn't get disconnected. Um, just go ahead and state your question again. Perhaps I can also help out. Well, I'm just saying um, I have a lot of ideas, and I'm not sure how to implement them. Um, you know, many ideas from, from political views to um, comparing Islam and Christianity as opposed to Judaism. Um, I'm not sure where to start. I mean, as far as ideas, I can get it all down on paper. I don't know what would be the next step to do after that. 
pick one. In all seriousness, pick one and, and move forward with it. Write out, write out what you're going to say. I mean, make a video. Maybe you want to make a talking head video like Ali has. Uh, maybe you want to make a, a, short, uh, a short drama or, or whatever it is. Just the whole thing is pick one and move forward with it. Okay. In all seriousness, I mean, ideas are great, but they're also dime a dozen. Exactly. Uh, uh, and the whole thing is to move forward. Uh, do something. Uh, in, in all seriousness, you, uh, the results will speak for themselves. Uh, and I mean, in the Message Mastery program that, that I'm going to conduct, I'm going to be walking people through the entire process of how to do it, what to do, uh, and, and I'm going to be giving them assignments and whatnot. Uh, and messagemastery.com, again, that's the website. But uh, I mean, in that process, I'm going to be going through the whole process. But if you want to start now, uh, then start. Write down your first script. Write it, film it, uh, uh, record it, edit it, put it on the internet, and okay, uh, and get. First production, I don't have any skills. I'll be honest with you. I'm, you know, it would be like a you know production 101 for me. I don't have the skills as far as writing goes. You know, all the ideas I can implement everything, but the production skills I don't yet have. Okay, do you have a camera at all in your house? A uh, video camera, nothing that I think would be appropriate to to use. Um, it's certainly. You know, not an expensive camera. I don't know what I would need. Well, do you have a home video camera to start off? Yes, I do. Okay. Have you ever done recording with that? Uh, just basic recording. Okay. Have you ever tried capturing the video from the camera to your computer? Um, I could certainly do that. Okay. And there's every computer, if you have a PC, every computer comes with a Windows Movie Maker, which is an, a basic editing program. If you have a Mac, you have iMovie. What you can do is you can use that program to capture that footage and start editing it. The whole thing is to start. You, you, you're going to find bumps and roll, bumps and uh, issues on the way. Uh, and uh, I mean, if you need any help, uh, I mean, the, I mean, my email is there on the website below, b e l a l at messagemastery dot com. Uh, and uh, but I'll definitely be able to move you forward with that, and also definitely get in on the program, uh, in which I'll be talking people through the whole process. Inshallah. Okay, good. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, it's a creative outlet, and I do appreciate it. It's very, um, it, it's wonderful to actually have people who are trying to get the message out, and I, I do appreciate it. Um, it's, it's getting me certainly motivated. You know, I know there's, you know, truth has to go out. So this is a great, a great venue. It's you know it's a sign of the times. So if we can't get it out on the on 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 online, then where is it going to go? Definitely. So I, I appreciate it. You're welcome. And uh, is that it, or do you have any more? That's that's it right now. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, uh, we have. Uh, okay, I guess I'm going to conclude the program now. Uh, I don't know if Ali's phone got disconnected. Ali, you still there? Um, if you're not there, I just want to say Jazakallah uh, Khairin. And then I definitely want to uh, say Jazakallah Khairin for everyone else that came in to listen in. I hope you have benefited. I know I did. But if you want to get in on the program or want more information, you can just go to www.messagemastery.com. And, uh, and on that, and I'll... There'll be a post right there letting you know exactly what to do, where to go, and how to register for the program. Um, so I hope everyone has benefited. And, uh, and for that, inshallah, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to end it with Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha ila ant. Nashadu wa puruka wa natubu ilayk. Wa al-asr inna l-insana lafi khusr illa al-lazina amanu wa aminu salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sab. Jazakallah khair for tuning in. And assalamu alaikum.